the next uh, speaker is Pyrus Gadhar. He is uh, speaking uh, from the Department of Radiation Oncology of Charité Hospital. So I'm happy to present his lecture about the use of the preclinical system lab uh, 200 to demonstrate the enhancing anti-cancer effects of amplitude modulation. I think this is going to be very interesting to know what results they have uh, regarding modulation. So please go ahead. Pyrus, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well and you can see my slides. Perfect. And uh, first of all, Ms. President, uh, dear organizers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm delighted uh, to be here to present our research. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, we have heard for the, for, of the last two very excellent presentations that uh, thermal therapy using high frequency electromagnetic fields or we can also consider it as classical hyperthermia, it can improve the outcomes in oncology as uh, described in multiple clinical trials. For instance, the combination of heat and radiation therapy across the board of all the diseases can improve the local control of radiation around about 15% as demonstrated in a recent um, a meta-analysis of data and colleagues. Regarding uh, the combination of heat and chemotherapy, we have the uh, landmark trial of Professor Isseltz uh, on high-risk uh, sarcomas where the neoadjuvant treatment plus heat improved overall survival as compared to neoadjuvant chemotherapy alone. So um, there's a lot of uh, important uh, research to do. Um, as we heard before, and uh, the main mechanisms for the results that have been presented is assumed to be uh, the temperature effect. And therefore, uh, important current researchers, uh, research focuses on clinical trials and uh, other disease sites, uh, treatment sequence, heat delivery, and uh, novel thermometry methods, uh, among other things. And this is very important. However, um, the question arises whether in addition to thermal um, uh, effects, also non-thermal anti-cancer effects may exist. Uh, well, the achievable temperatures uh, in terms of the T90 uh, of classical hyperthermia in clinical practice can be rather low, uh, as we know from our own experience. Uh, it might be uh, in the range of uh, lower than 41 degrees, um, uh, at least in some cases. And we know uh, 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 when we take a closer look on the famous preclinical water bath experiments, uh, um, they reveal that actually temperatures of 41 degrees and higher are required to obtain synergistic effects uh, with radiation or chemotherapy, especially if the radiation is not simultaneously uh, uh, conducted uh, with the heat treatment. And likewise, we know that also from our experiments that uh, the oncological results after extreme whole body hyperthermia using 42 degrees in the whole body for an hour were uh, disappointing, uh, at least to our um, experiments um, uh, experience. So thus, we believe that the positive results of the uh, classical hyperthermia in the multiple trials um, cannot be attributed to temperature uh, effects uh, alone. And uh, therefore, uh, we hypothesize that uh, non-thermal anti-cancer effects of radio frequency fields do exist. In addition, uh, the available positive trials on cervical cancer, uh, one with an uh, annular phase array system, uh, one with a capacitive system, and one with a capacitive system using amplitude modulation by means of modulated electrohyperthermia, reveal a striking low power used in the case of amplitude modulation, suggesting higher effectiveness. So if we go through the trials, uh, we have the landmark trial of Van der See, which we heard uh, before, published in 2000, 
using a total power of around 400 to 800 watts. Then we have uh, the data of Harima um, uh, from 2001 and 2016 uh, using a total power of 800 to 1,500 watt. And then finally, we have the MINAR uh, data. We will hear about this later as well um, from 2019 using approximately 130 watt. So besides uh, this clinical evidence uh, and uh, long-term uh, data became available uh, suggesting overall survival benefit uh, uh, um, at ASTRO 2021 from, from this trial, um, multiple preclinical publications uh, from different groups uh, on in vitro and in vivo experiments have been published on this method using modulated fields as recently nicely summarized by Krenach and Wanzig. However, only few is mentioned uh, regarding the characteristics uh, and the importance of amplitude modulation um, in these uh, manuscripts, which we regard as the major difference in comparison to other approaches of radio frequency based classical hyperthermia. And despite all the evidence mentioned, this data is somehow controversially discussed in the field. And one reason for this might be that the attempts to explain these effects have so far not been accepted really by the field. Uh, we were eager therefore to develop a model to help to explain the effects of modulated fields. And uh, we hypothesize that modulated fields increase anti-cancer effects. Let me show you the benefits of modulated fields and uh, our model to explain these. High frequency fields in the megahertz range as depicted in uh, green here, they have predominantly thermal effects. And importantly, they are steerable to distinct sides of the body. Low frequency fields in the hertz to kilohertz range as depicted in red here, they do have non-thermal effects at the membrane, at the ion channels. They can lead to ion disequilibrium and non-thermal cell kill, but they are not steerable. Amplitude modulation can now combine the advantages of the two components using a high frequency carrier with a low frequency envelope. According to our model, um, ion channels in the membrane act as rectifiers and low pass filters, leading to demodulation of the signal at the cell membrane, resulting in a low frequency envelope that can cause non-thermal anti-cancer effects and cell kill at the tumor site. Um, it is important to highlight that there is a difference in the ion channel expression between healthy cells and cancer cells and also different in the membrane potential. And therefore the cancer cells are more susceptible to this novel approach. Our research was performed with a lab EHY200 device, which was kindly provided to us by Oncotam. The system tunes various applicators uh, to the carrier frequency of 13.5 megahertz and allows amplitude modulation. First, we were using an in vitro applicator with a glass chamber that you see here on the right, which allowed temperature measurement in the cell sample, but led to an automatic power reduction when the temperature, the target temperature was reached. So we obtained data with this applicator comparing temperature and uh, unmodulated radio frequency, uh, which I show you in a second, but then we moved ahead and used other applicators to test our second hypothesis. To study non-thermal effects, it is important to differentiate non-thermal from thermal effects. And therefore, a novel in vitro applicator was established that you see here on the left side, uh, using a water circulation system for temperature control, resembling the perfusion in the in vivo situation. And this applicator now allows to treat at a set target temperature with a constant field strength. And for the in vivo experiments, we conducted the previously well-described in vivo applicator was used. 
Uh, it's important to note that all these applicators operate with a frequency spectrum for modulation, like in the uh, available clinical devices. So before we conducted experiments, we performed um, uh, uh, applicate, uh, we, the applicators underwent extensive performance checks and quality assurance. We wanted uh, to exclude that unrecognized power or temperature peaks exist that may blur our analysis of non-thermal effects. So therefore we used the previously described temperature rise method to describe the specific absorption rate SAR um, using the formula you see here on the right in the box. So here I just show you an example of an uh, in vitro experiment where you can see on the left side the temperature increase curve. Um, and uh, we focused on the rise time after tuning, which you see here, and then established the regression line that you see here on the right um, to establish the temperature rise per time to calculate then the SAR uh, in a reproducible fashion. So um, we noted, uh, for instance, that when we use our novel in vitro applicator uh, with outflow that you see on the left here, uh, uh, example temperature increase curve, that we derive an SAR of around 290 watt per kilogram, which is large in comparison to the clinical achieved around 10 to 20 watt per kilogram. And for instance, if we used on the right side, the in vitro applicator with the temperature control switched uh, on, um, then uh, uh, it results in a half temperature increase um, or SAR. So these uh, um, uh, has to be considered uh, and we did so. So we moved ahead and uh, performed computer simulations of all of our applicators using sim for life software. And here you see the results of the in vivo um, ex, uh, applicator uh, as an example for these calculations. Um, in the left, uh, you see in the upper part, uh, the SAR simulations uh, showing uh, high SAR values, but only at the applicator edge and not uh, at the tumor side actually. And this is confirmed below uh, where you see the SAR volume uh, histogram. In the right, you see that we uh, were also uh, able to uh, simulate the temperature distributions. And on the right, uh, a lower part, you see the temperature volume histogram uh, confirming that actually only temperatures below 40.1 Celsius occur. And uh, you have to uh, know that uh, the target temperature for our, our in vivo experiments that I show you later was 40 degrees. So. We therefore conclude that the applicators uh, provided to us and that we used are suitable to study non-thermal effects. So uh, based on that, two years ago, we started uh, experiments with uh, first with the glass chamber in vitro applicator that I showed you to investigate potential non-thermal anti-cancer effects of radio frequency fields. And we were able to publish this in scientific reports uh, with the following data. In a human uh, colorectal cancer model, we treated two uh, commonly used colorectal cancer cell lines, the HD29 and the SW480 cell line, and treated them with 30 minutes radio frequency at 42 degrees and compared proliferation, which you see here above in the two images, uh, and clonogenicity, which you see below, um, compared that with 42 degrees water bath treatment. And we found that proliferation and clonogenicity were significantly decreased when the radio frequency fields were used compared to the use of temperature in both cell lines. And I believe this is an exciting result as it proved the existence of non-thermal anti-cancer effects thanks to radio frequency fields. So we were now very eager to further investigate on our second hypothesis uh, to test uh, additional amplitude modulation on anti-cancer effects and uh, therefore use the novel in vitro applicator for this purpose. So we uh, performed uh, in vitro experiments on several colorectal cancer cell lines and here I share with you uh, the results on the uh, 
prior used HD29 cell line. So we used a 37 degrees water bath as a negative control and compared 30 minutes of water bath heating at 42 degrees with um, unmodulated fields first at 42 degrees that you see here the results on the left. And we used apoptosis, apoptosis and necrosis as biological endpoints. And you see on the left uh, that uh, there was actually no significant difference. However, on the right, we compared 42 degrees water bath heating with modulated fields at 42 degrees and observed significantly increased necrosis when we used modulated fields at the cancer cells. In a xenograph mouse model, using the same cell line HT29, uh, we could confirm that tumor growth in the mice was significantly inhibited by the use of modulated fields. And these are exciting results as they prove the existence of non-thermal anti-cancer effects thanks to modulated fields. So these results were not obtained by myself alone, but are by our interdisciplinary dedicated team that you see here. And it's a lot of fun also uh, to work with uh, this team. So uh, what are our next steps in Berlin? We for sure will continue the in vitro and in vivo investigations on um, the effects of radiofrequency uh, to treat uh, cancer, also uh, the additional effects of modulation, just in order to improve the available uh, uh, treatment options in oncology for the better. And uh, we will also move ahead to perform computer simulations and human cancer models. So to use CT data sets with different disease sites and, and uh, cancer volumes, just, to, or just to, to prepare clinical trials and to see uh, what's possible with the current uh, sets of applicators. And of course, we will um, try um, to launch clinical trials, for instance, on liver, uh, treatments, uh, for instance, in colorectal cancer patients with uh, advanced uh, liver metastasis failing after different lines of chemotherapy without any chance for uh, other treatment options to combine modulated field treatment to deliver with chemotherapy or um, uh, to use brain treatments, for instance, in glioblastoma to combine radiochemotherapy um, with uh, modulated fields. And I think in the next talk, we will hear exciting results on first patients on a similar approach. And this liver and brain treatments are also then cancer sites where the temperature uh, cannot be um, uh, achieved, uh, uh, which would be effective when uh, as a standalone treatment. So I think this, this work will be important. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we have outlined a model explaining non-thermal membrane anti-cancer effects thanks to modulated fields. We have further excluded thermal effects by temperature control in the in vitro applicator and by performing computer simulations of all the applicators used. And based on this, we have compared modulated and unmodulated fields and showed higher anti-cancer effects for modulated field, fields in vitro and in vivo. So the story will be continued next year. And with this, I close. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Vaidus. I think it's, it's really interesting what you present because I think non-thermal effects are really, really important and we have a, a tremendous field of research there because I think that component is a very important part uh, of, of the treatment to have the best results. Uh, just one comment, I, I am not uh, seeing right hands so please, if you have any question, write in the chat box. I, I don't know why it's not the, the part for the right hand. So uh, I would like to ask you something. Uh, you, you showed a slide uh, saying that you see a lot of necrosis when you use modulation. 
And for me, that was a little bit confusing because maybe a professor SAS can also uh, share his, his knowledge about this because it, with modulation, I am used to see articles saying that what we see mainly is apoptosis, not necrosis. So uh, for me, that slide was confused, confusing because of that, because you, you saw a lot of necrosis and I used to see with a modulated electrohyperthermia that what we have is apoptosis. So I don't know if you have any explanation about that. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the question. Um, I think uh, Andra Sass would be the excellent one to, to take this question, but maybe I can give you two, three sentences before from my perspective. Um, so there was a trend for late apoptosis as well that we recognized. And uh, I think uh, um, uh, when we look at the in vitro results, uh, we have to be aware of the of the limitations also of these uh, experiments because we, in the in vitro, in the in vivo setting, even in, in immune compromised uh, mice, we saw even a stronger effect. Uh, we will try to publish this data uh, as soon as we can. We, we will further elaborate on that. But the effect was stronger in, in vivo, so probably due to uh, uh, different uh, uh, electrical properties, uh, as we know, uh, on the macroscopic scale with different permittivity and other um, effects. So um, it's not so not so easy to, rep to, to, to really show the effect in vitro. Um, but uh, oh, we saw that uh, in several cell lines, and uh, uh, so um, for for me, this is an this is an uh, uh, sign uh, just uh, that was confirmed in vivo, which is then considered more important. Um, and uh, uh, we will try to further that. Can I that that, that can I tell you? to elaborate on the mechanisms on the protein and um, genet genetic level to further elaborate on the biological effects. Great, thank you. So, Professor, if, if you want to comment, please. Yeah, a, a, a little, because of course, it's, uh, this topic is very new to my heart and uh, uh, to my research. Uh, uh, Pius, I congratulate for your research. It's really excellent. Uh, and. Uh, 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 this was somehow missing from the literature that uh, uh, that show the real effect of the modulation in, in the in the modulated field. So about necrosis and apoptosis. Uh, apoptosis needs time. So it means that we uh, have taken the the samples after 24 hours. So the late apoptosis only, uh, which we measured. Uh, some uh, publications, uh, not from all labs, but uh, some have worldwide, they measured the early apoptosis as well in Japan, in Taiwan, in uh, uh, Korea. Uh, but uh, uh, that was not so emphasized like the late apoptosis measured with different, uh, different uh, immunohistochemical methods. So this is the first that when the, the, uh, the samples were taken to study. The second one is a, a, a more a wider question, that is the immunology uh, connection. So uh, generally, we ha generally we have uh, many points which connects all apoptosis to the to the immunology, uh, to the immune cells which are intact. Uh, I, I have to mention that if the if you are over 40, 40 centigrade, then there are publications that the immune cells are blocked are somehow uh, uh, frozen, <laughs> not the size, it's not, not frozen, but the activity is frozen. Uh, and uh, uh, this is really a point why uh, we are, uh, we would like really to remain in, in low uh, uh, power to, uh, to have uh, not go over 41 in any parts of the tumor. So maybe, but this again needs uh, uh, research, uh, maybe that the immune uh, effects have some uh, ad additional points to the uh, to the uh, uh, apoptosis. Why it is so? I tell you very quickly. Always we are uh, developing heat shock proteins, and the, the uh, massive 
uh, effect, modulation effect, uh, expels the heat shock proteins of the membrane. So we have saturation of the membrane heat shock proteins on the on the cell uh, 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 outside of the cell, which is everybody knows that absolutely a, a good attractor for the natural killer cells. So it means that the the natural killer cells are are uh, attacking those cell, those tumor cells which were not affected uh, before. So it means that uh, somehow it's a selection factor. So maybe that this is also a, a point. Uh, and the uh, extracellular each of protein, uh, that is the next one, which uh, gives information for the, for the uh, uh, adipose, uh, uh, for the, the uh, uh, addi uh, additive, uh, for the immune, uh, immune system, which, uh, which learns the T cells, which learns the, the, uh, the genetic uh, information and then uh, this will be uh, attacking again the, the tumor cells and the tumor in large. This is my thinking. Okay, so thank you so much. It's your your comments are always very helpful. So we have another question from Ayas. I don't know if you would want to do it yourself. We can, you can open your microphone if you want and ask and comment anything. I'm going to ask him any other way I, I can. Yeah, so hello Ayas, do you hear me? So, so do you want to ask yourself? Okay, I'm going to read his question. So he's saying very important work. Uh, they are, he's saying that uh, we have lots of preclinical evidence that only indirectly translate to clinical results. I strongly believe that the difference between pre and clinical results is the duration of treatments. Individual cells and small experimentation animals have a totally different biological turnover than humans. And uh, he's saying that 15 treatments are not enough for humans. So if one or two treatments are enough for mice, what should be the anal analog for humans? So how many treatments? So you have um, yeah. yeah, that was a long question. Thank you very much for reading it. And thank you for the question. I think uh, it's, uh, it's one uh, thing that we have to figure out the right dose. I mean, we, in the classical hyperthermia, it's like uh, once or twice a week uh, 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 for the duration of the chemo or radiation therapy. Um, in the classical hyperthermia, there are um, problems with uh, temperature tolerance, uh, which might then be less uh, problematic. I think this is a very important point. I'm not sure if 15 treatments are, are not enough for humans, because I believe in the South African cervical trial, as far as I know, which was quite effective, there were not that many uh, treatment sessions. So. But I agree that, I mean, we are not going to, you know, take uh, our uh, in vitro uh, results and, uh, and translate this uh, to, to the clinic. But there's many open questions regarding the duration of uh, one session or the, the number of se sessions per week or to use it simultaneously or adjuvantly also. Um, so there is a lot uh, uh, to be done. There's, uh, great workload or we can say there's a great chance uh, uh, to, to do these uh, analysis together during the next uh, years. So um, yeah, I think uh, what we believe uh, there can be a, a new dose maybe uh, 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 defined, uh, which is maybe connected to the E-field of modulated fields and uh, time or so, but uh, this will this will be a matter of future research. Pyrrhus, excuse me, I have a very slow connection. This is the reason I do not intervene. Uh, but my center, the center of my point is that experimental animals uh, have a lifespan of about two years, while humans have a lifespan of about 80 years. So the, the difference is huge. 
the, tur the biological uh, turn turnover is huge, is totally different. This is the reason I suggest that we should uh, calculate the the duration, not in, in terms of uh, how long how long the the single treatment will last, but how many treatments we will have. Conferences, and I think I have not received any meaningful answer yet. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your your uh, clear thinking uh, for the design of this uh, excellent study. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for getting your uh, question wrong, but um, uh, of course, yeah, we have to we have to make up our minds and. Uh, probably need to be in contact to clarify this. It's not clear to me yet. Uh, maybe uh, uh, so. What I can, can tell you is that our plans before we go, maybe also into the clinic, we are in contact with a small animal clinic with dogs or something. There you have then some an intermediate uh, a model uh, towards the humans uh, um, and to to. to uh, uh, um, identify the appropriate dose there, maybe as a step for humans and then the remaining we can find out from my end uh, in clinical trials that we need to conduct. I hope yeah, this is a good, uh, better answer. Thank you. Thank you, Pyrus. Uh, I, I think uh, Professor Dr. Stefan Badis uh, wants to comment something, maybe from your lecture and from the previous one, because he raised his hand, but I didn't see him. So please, Dr. Bodis, if you want to comment something, we have some minutes. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's, it's really brief. Um, I probably start with um, Piers' talk, Professor Gaudio's talk. Thank you, Piers. Excellent. And I think this was the really needed that you separate um, the amplitude modulation from the thermotherapy effect. This is crucial. Um, it's good, you know, things started with clinical observation, it works, but there was still a lack of rational behind it. And I think this um, approach should be strengthened also maybe within research network structures. Congratulations. And a very brief comment for Professor Tata's talk, Nilo's talk, maybe for all of us. You know, we learned in the pandemic, the supply chain starts to break or is broken. And it's also difficult to storage some of the medical supplies like uh, chemotherapy drugs or immune modulation drugs, which need to be freezing. So with hypothermia, we have things on place. And this is probably not only important for centers in um, LMI countries, that instead of you know, really suffering with broken supply chains, you can offer treatment modality, which is on site and which is there, and which is not so much dependent on supply chains. That's all, thank you very much. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think we don't have uh, more questions for the participants. 